From day one of AEW, the women's division had always been at a disadvantage. Unlike the men's division, they didn't have established mainstream stars that carried the division on their back, and they didn't have many female veterans to learn from apart from Awesome Kong who didn't stay in AEW for very long. And in this way, the AEW women's division had to be built from the ground up. Effectively, the women's division was thrown into the deep end of live wrestling TV in a sink or swim environment. Even though the pre-pandemic AEW women's division wasn't the greatest, there was many signs of great potential through the emergence of new stars like Jamie Hayter, Big Swole, Penelope Ford, Shanna, Nyla Rose, Hikaru Shida, B. Priestley, Britt Baker, Yuka Sakazaki, Chris Statlander, Emi Sakura, Riho, and more. I mean, just going through all these names, you can see the potential that the AEW women's division had before the pandemic started. The women's division was clearly being built around the four pillars of Nyla Rose, Britt Baker, Hikaru Shida, and mainly Riho, who was the inaugural AEW women's champion. It took a while for these women to get accustomed to live TV, but they began to excel and they started to lay the building blocks of the AEW women's division. Chris Statlander also got over organically and earned a title shot at AEW Revolution 2020 against Nyla Rose. There were some very memorable feuds from the pre-pandemic era in the women's division like Rio vs Nyla Rose 1 and 2, 2 was my favorite by the way, B Priestley vs Britt Baker, Emi Sakura vs Rio, Chris Statlander vs The Nightmare Collective. Even though it was remembered for all the wrong reasons. I'm looking at you, Japanese deathmatch legend Dr. Luther. The women's division really started to pick up steam, and although it was still very rough around the edges, there were signs of big things to come. The future was looking bright. That is until the pandemic hit. When the world was going crazy and the coronavirus pandemic just hit, it had left the AEW women's division in the worst shape it had ever been in, and it was the lowest the AEW women's division had ever gotten. Many big stars that were integral parts of the women's division were either unavailable or had to go back to their respective countries. The biggest loss that AEW faced was Riho. She was basically the face of the women's division up until that point, and she was their biggest loss by far as she was one of the biggest TV draws. If I was Jim Ross, I would say when Rio had to go back to Japan, it left a huge 97 pound hole in the women's division. I mean, that's a good old JR for you. And from this point, the women's division was mainly directionless, as a few dynamites directly after the pandemic first started didn't even have any women's matches. And if there was a women's match, it was mainly against a jobber or enhancement talent. But one positive that came from this period was that Anna Jay was one of the jobbers and she is a star. But besides that, there were no real storylines during this period, so there was nothing that the audience could really sink their teeth into. And the AEW Women's World Champion match at Double or Nothing was kind of just thrown together and it was Hikaru Shida versus Nyla Rose, with Hikaru Shida becoming the new AEW Women's World Champion. And what made the division even worse was when Chris Atlander suffered an anterior cruciate ligament injury or an ACL injury which left her out for up to more than 6 months. The AEW women's division was in really, really bad shape at this point and something had to be done. So AEW decided to have a women's tag team tournament. While this was a step in the right direction, it seriously exposed the lack of depth that the AEW women's division had. With Brandy Rose and Ali versus Diamante and Ivelisse making the final, with the latter winning the women's tag team tournament. About half of the women who competed in this tournament weren't signed to official AEW contracts, so they were relatively new faces, and this did not help the division at all. And what also didn't help was that most of it was on YouTube, so naturally a lot of eyes wouldn't be on it. But despite this, AEW were moving in the right direction with the women's division. Two women really got the gears going and started turning the tides for the AEW women's division. Thunder Rosa, who debuted in August 2020 
and Serena Deeb, who debuted in September 2020. Thunder Rosa was the NWA's Women's World Heavyweight Champion at the time, and she brought a sense of legitimacy and intensity that the AEW Women's Division hadn't really seen, and she is one of the best women's wrestlers in the world. She lit a spark in the AEW Women's Division, and what she brings to AEW is massive. Thunder Rosa faced Hikaru Shida at All Out in 2020 in what I would consider one of the best women's matches of 2020. And this is testament to the instant impact that Thunder Rosa had on the women's division. And funnily enough, Serena Deeb debuted against Thunder Rosa. And to be honest, I wasn't really sold on Serena Deeb when I first saw her wrestle in AEW. What occupied my mind was that she was just a side piece in the straight edge society with CM Punk and she's just another woman's wrestler who's going to pass through AEW. But boy was I wrong. Not only is she an amazing wrestler who can uplift others to her level and have a banger of a match with almost anybody, but she's also a veteran who has had a lot of TV wrestling experience and who can help younger talent to get used to TV style wrestling. AEW hadn't had a constant female veteran to help out the women's division, so Serena Deeb's importance in AEW is paramount. But despite these two massive acquisitions, AEW still booked their women's division very poorly, as around this time we entered into the cursed era of one women's match every show in the cooldown spot before the main event. These matches were always short in length, and if they were longer, there was always an ad break that was inserted right in the middle. This was the problem with the booking of the AEW women's division. It was almost like they took one step forward to take two steps backwards. This was evident with Hikaru Shida's opponent for Full Gear 2020 being announced a week and a half before the pay-per-view and it was just a rehashed match with Nyla Rose, the same women's match as Double or Nothing. This showed the lack of care in the women's division and during this period, sometimes I'd be watching a women's match on Dynamite and I realize, damn, it's evident AEW doesn't care about the women's division, so why should I? and I really didn't care about the women's matches that were going on. And that feeling really, really sucked because I absolutely love women's wrestling and I know the potential that it has. But little by little, AEW started to book the women's division better. And with the pandemic coming closer to ending, there was light at the end of the tunnel with stars like Shanna making a return and the woman who the women's division was supposed to be built around and one of AEW's biggest TV draws, Rio, came back. This all helped the women's division greatly. AEW also introduced the Women's Eliminator Tournament, which saw women from Japan and the USA compete for the number one contendership of Hikaru Shida's Women's World Championship. Both brackets in this tournament were very strong, unlike the Women's Tag Team Tournament. And the AEW Women's Eliminator Tournament saw top stars like Yuka Sakazaki, Emi Sakura, and Aya Kong make a return to AEW, albeit while being in Japan. And we saw new stars like Mei Suruga, Veni, Rin Kadokura, Ryo Mizunami, and the cutest in the world, Maki Ito. I mean, even Tony Khan agrees with me. Right, Tony? Maki Ito. Thanks, Tony. But anyway, Ryo Mizunami won the Eliminated Tournament and had a fantastic match against Shida at Revolution. And the pleasant surprise of the massively popular Maki Ito at Revolution just poured gas onto the already growing fire of the women's division. This hot streak of booking led to the first women's main event in the history of AEW Dynamite in Thunder Rosa vs Britt Baker. And as far as main events go in general, this is one of the best main events in the history of Dynamite and one of the best matches of 2021 for men and women period. I mean, it was hard hitting, bloody, and told an excellent but brutal story. And the feud going into this match between Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa was top notch, and I might even say it's the greatest feud the AEW women's division has seen since AEW's inception in 2019. At this point, AEW also started to have two women's matches on the Dynamite card sometimes, and Chris Dietlander, who I'm sure AEW has huge plans for, made a return in a spectacular fashion. And with Anna Jay, Red Velvet, Layla Hirsch, Tay Conti firing on all cylinders, and Serena Deeb putting on banger after banger after banger after banger after banger after banger, after banger. <laughs> and Jade Cargill being Jade Cargill, the women's division was in a very healthy place. If you've realized, there's been two constant fixtures in the AEW women's division. 
and these two constant fixtures are Hikaru Shida and Britt Baker. Hikaru Shida is massively underappreciated and she's played an important role in the women's division as she's held the division down for over a year and she's made the most of the crumbs that she's gotten from AEW management. People hate on the AEW women's division but they never ever hate on Hikaru Shida. Why? It's because she's a credible champion who produced excellent matches. And then there's Britt Baker. It took a while for Britt Baker to find her feet in AEW, but once she got the ball rolling, she absolutely ran with it. Her heel work is some of the best in AEW, and AEW have a legit star on their hands in Britt Baker. So because of all of these factors, it was only fitting that the two constant fixtures of the AEW women's division face off in a match for the women's world championship in the first full capacity show in over a year at AEW's Double or Nothing 2021. Britt Baker came out on top in a really good match and she deserved to win it. It's been clear from day one that AEW has been trying to build a division around her and she's more than ready to fulfill her role as the head of the table. Unfortunately, this hot streak of booking came to an end after Double or Nothing and currently the AEW women's division is in a sort of slump. It's the typical story of the AEW women's division. They get momentum and the carpet is pulled right out from under them. And even though the division is not in the most healthy state right now, I have faith that sooner or later Tony Khan will get it right. And with AEW being on the road again and Rampage coming in August, I feel like we're on the cusp of another boom period in the AEW women's division. AEW Rampage will have an additional hour of TV and this hour will be helpful because the women will be able to get more TV time to develop their characters and promo skills and have more and higher quality matches and have more engaging storylines. And what would help the division even more is older stars that could return to AEW as the pandemic comes to an end. And there's a good few free agents floating around in the wrestling world that I think would be a great fit in AEW, like Heidi Lovelace, formerly known as Ruby Riot. The AEW women's division has a lot of potential and with a few tweaks here and there, I wouldn't be surprised if in a few years we have this conversation again and the AEW women's division is the very best in the world. Thank you for watching the video. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Why don't you rate it? Please leave a like, share and subscribe and leave a comment telling me what you think or what you thought about the video. And please follow me on my social medias on Twitter at SunnyTheJobba and on Instagram at SunnyTheJobba. But anyway, thank you again and keep on rocking in the free world. Until next time, goodbye and good night. Bang!